technology ahead of time. I've uh, been involved with a lot of information on this uh, COVID-19 disease state and the virus, uh, working as a consultant for a number of different organizations, including um, I'm the uh, physician for the Boy Scouts for San Diego um, and the, uh, in the desert that's here um, next to San Diego. I also work with the ECHO program out of New Mexico and have been monitoring a lot of other programs. I, work at a federal clinic in San Diego, which had to do early interventions to prevent the uh, uh, COVID-2 or COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, from spreading inside our uh, organization. So let's get down to some of the key issues here. Um, we're going to take a look at uh, COVID-19 as the um, second leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, it's killed more people than motor vehicle accidents and a number of the wars that we've been in over the last hundred years, uh, we're catching up, uh, but not quite at the number of deaths related to the 1918 H1N1 virus. And we're really talking about this as a viral disease. We're not talking about what animal it came from. We're not talking about what city or country that it originated in. So I think these are really important issues from a terminology perspective. All right. Death rates from SARS-CoV-2 are much higher than you are seeing in the news. These are spikes in death rates in a number of different countries. Um, and this, these are deaths that aren't necessarily linked to anything. They may be uh, uh, blamed to have died from a pneumonia, a typical pneumonia. They may have uh, not have died in a hospital and may not actually have anything related on their death certificate you're seeing a spike. So what I usually look at is the death rate and I multiply it times two or three. Then I look at the infection rate and multiply it times 10 to actually get what I think are the real numbers that are going on um, today. You can look at these uh, excess deaths in the United States in 2020. Uh, these are deaths other than reported for COVID-19. Uh, and you've got the COVID-19 deaths reported um, in, a second, in a different color. But we just think that there's a terrible underreporting because there's under testing. We're still under 2% of the US population being tested. And there's a lot of theories why the testing rate is so low, um, but that's a fact and our statistics are um, off markedly. So there's a lot going on. You already heard about uh, oxygen and airway management, ECMO management. Um, there's obviously part of management is personal protection equipment. Uh, part of management is diagnostics. And right now, RT-PCR is the key issue. The sero serologic test looks more at epidemiologic data and exposure, but doesn't tell you about active infection. We're gonna get deep into uh, clinical uh, treatments, uh, medication treatments predominantly is what we're gonna look at here, but we'll also talk about things like uh, development of vaccine. So <clears throat> you've got a lot of things going on with this virus. You have this immune response, you have a viral entry, viral um, uh, that's in the cell through lysosomal escape. Uh, you have a virus that's replicating with an RNA polymerase uh, you've got proteases. Remember, this is a virus that has a capsid and has an envelope. Sounds uh, similar to what you see with hepatitis B in some ways. So you have things that may inhibit protein production by the virus and may inhibit viral replication itself. Uh, we'll talk briefly about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine and different ways that those medications might be working. And there's some other immune mechanisms, including toll-like receptors that may be involved. So you saw an introductory slide about this uh, virus attaching. Uh, it attaches directly to a receptor. That's the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor two. And it also has this uh, protease, uh, it's a TMPR protease that's involved with the uh, um, uh, attachment and uptake into uh, the cells. Uh, and it's possible that neutralizing antibodies exist. And you'll hear more about that in the next presentation. This is a very complicated diagram. It's probably not showing up that well on a lot of your screens, but um, you have to look again at the details of the attachment here, the protease uh, co-receptor, the ACE2 receptor. You have this membrane fusion, endocytosis that takes place. You have an uncoating or lysosomal escape that takes place. 
Then you have the RNA release, you have RNA replication, RNA translation, the polypeptides, the non-structural and structural proteins. That RNA has an RNA-dependent polymerase that makes further RNA, and then you have packaging and assembly inside uh, the viral. So you have many, many different places where we can attack this virus. I'm gonna talk predominantly about uh, remdesivir today. Uh, it's the, what uh, you saw probably a number of news releases that took place in the last 24 hours. And Anthony Fauci usually takes a conservative approach coming out with some uh, pretty incredible accolades. I also wanna highlight that the chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine story is still pending. But with this time, we have no, um, I would say compelling information that these drugs actually abrogate this disease. And uh, use of those should be in um, controlled trials with cardiac monitoring. And I'll get into that just a little bit more. A lot of our patients are on antihypertensives. We know patients with hypertension have worse outcomes with COVID-19. There's a lot of controversy about whether these ACE inhibitors or ARBs, uh, the angiotensin II receptor blockers should be discontinued or we should be using those to block entry of the virus. Um, at this time, the word is we don't think that these are interfering with any viral mechanisms, um, but the good news is they're not making the disease worse. So the standard of care is to continue your ACE inhibitors or your ARBs unless the patient's hypertensive and if there's hypertension present, you would taper them off these medications, but it doesn't appear to make the disease worse or better. All right, the big news that came out was uh, today was about remdesivir. This is an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase inhibitor. It was originally developed by Gilead Sciences to combat Ebola. But they already had some information that this was an anti-SARS drug that would work potentially to abrogate, abrogate that disease in different animal models. They didn't have sufficient information about human trials because the SARS uh, infection was limited, self-limited, and didn't have enough time to develop clinical trials. So by inhibiting this RNA polymerase, you can decrease viral load, viral production, and uh, this is a broad-based uh, coronavirus medication, so it may be useful uh, even as this disease mutates. So what was released today um, were two packets of information. One was an update on a clinical trial that took place in China in Wuhan, uh, this trial was only in, only enrolled about a quarter of the patients that were originally um, going to be enrolled in that trial. So the trial was stopped due to poor enrollment and it was a negative study, but due to small number of patients, it was terribly underpowered. And I'm just gonna discount and set that set study aside. The uh, next study released that took place uh, uh, with information today was in over a thousand patients. Um, and this controlled study also took place and it had two different arms. They had a five day and 10 day arm. The five day arm uh, actually had better benefit than the 10 day arm and shortened hospitalization time by four days. We'll have a lot more information on this as it goes through peer review but the press release was enough that Anthony Fauci came out and made a very strong statement uh, that this medication appears to be working and appears to be a major step forward. I'd also refer you back to the New England Journal trial. I'll get into that a little bit more. That was a case series, also uh, decreased um, the time on ventilator, decreased time in ICU. Uh, decreased time in hospital. So I think we do have um, substantial progress with remdesivir. And we'll talk about that <clears throat> a little bit more. You're gonna hear about neutralizing antibodies, but I just wanna um, state that there are patients with lo uh, low, uh, medium, low, medium, high, and high titers of these neutralizing antibodies, and those patients appear to do better. So we've got some very interesting information about this. The problem is the serologic tests that are being performed today uh, by Quest and a number of the other laboratories. These are just antibodies that are IgM and IgG antibodies, but we have no idea if those antibodies indicate that they're neutralizing or protective. Basically, they just indicate exposure and they probably have a sensitivity in the 80% range. So if you have a negative antibody test, it doesn't mean you haven't been exposed. It just, if it's positive, it does indicate a high probability of exposure to the COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2, 
but there is cross reactivity to other coronaviruses. And as you know, 10 to 20% of the flu like syndromes we see each winter into the spring are due to coronaviruses, not due to standard influenza. So this is another important story here. This is a, a case report of using IVIG, which uh, had uh, evidence of neutralizing antibodies and low molecular weight heparin. This is a disease that is a hypercoagulable state. So when you develop COVID-19, there are a series of coagulation abnormalities that take place. This can be documented through a number of different steps with uh, D-dimers that are in the 2000 range, or you can use thromboelastography or rotum to show that these patients have a hypercoagulable state by changes in what are called the R and K and maximum amplitude on the uh, thromboelastography. But uh, we've seen a number of young uh, individuals, young adults developing stroke um, from this hypercoagulable state. There's a number of pulmonary conditions where it's hypercoagulable. So uh, there's a number of clinical trials going on with low molecular weight heparin and other anticoagulants. But uh, this is not to be done at home. Uh, it's not to be done as an outpatient. This should be in an inpatient controlled setting, uh, preferably in the setting of clinical trials. Um, this, uh, I'm just going to move quickly through the toclizumab. This is a um, IL-6 and antagonist that appears to shorten um, ICU time, um, increase the, number, the chance of patients being discharged, improving oxygenation, uh, increasing uh, lymphocytes actually in patients. So toclizumab's in a number of clinical trials. Uh, there's a substantial number, amount of information out that this medication uh, does have a benefit for patients. Uh, but definitely needs to be done in an ICU uh, setting or hospital setting, and preferably in the setting of controlled trials as well. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine do a lot of different things. They change cytokine expression, they change TLR signaling, they change lysosome pH, they change lysosome release of virus. Uh, that's the upside of these in terms of uh, potential antiviral effects. There's been a number of uh, studies now that have come out that have shown uh, significant cardiac toxicity and an increased uh, mortality rate. And in my opinion, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine either should not be used or should only be used in the setting of uh, very controlled trials um, uh, specifically. This was a study that was halted um, due to risk of fatal heart complications. Uh, it's a study that was done in Brazil, but there have been a number of other uh, studies that have also shown prolonged QT, uh, cardiac arrhythmias, and uh, cardiac arrhythmias associated with that. Another uh, interesting is, is this man heard about chloroquine and decided to go get some um, uh, uh, the substance that's used for uh, cleaning fish tanks and overdosed on this and uh, died. So it's a lot of, um, um, say, fake news that's going out, on out there, and uh, we really need to be able to control this messaging. Uh, this hydroxychloroquine uh, in the uh, central column, hydroxychloroquine plus uh, azithromycin, and then a control population of 158. And you can see the deaths in the hydroxychloroquine, 27%, uh, hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin, 22% and the non-treatment group only 11%. So there is data out that the mortality rate is higher with this treatment. FDA even came out with a specific statement about this high-risk uh, setting. A lot of, it, of news about coronavirus vaccines. Uh, yesterday there was an Oxford uh, news release. Today there was a news release from Germany. Uh, everybody is being very, very cautious about the coronavirus vaccine development. There was a coronavirus vaccine for SARS that was developed. But what happens with coronavirus, like you also see with dengue, you give the vaccine and then you get an immune response and then you get exposed to the virus and you have a hyper antiviral effect that results in uh, um, much higher complication rates, um, inflammation, and a higher risk of death. So coronaviruses, dengue, um, other RNA viruses, uh, it's going to be very complicated to develop the right vaccine that balances benefit and risk. But we are seeing a huge amount of activity. The fastest um, vaccine development that's taken place in the history of the world was for mumps. 
and that took four years for that vaccine to go from identifying a potential um, path forward with the vaccine to getting it into humans to getting it to, to uh, clinical availability and FDA approval, four years. So we may be able to do it faster. We have a lot of new technology, um, but we need to be very cautious. We need to make uh, sure we're not harming patients. You're gonna hear more about convalescent plasma therapy, but I just wanna highlight this has been used in SARS, MERS, and H1N1. I won't go into any more details because you're going to have another talk and presentation on that. But there is some um, improvement that was published uh, with uh, improvement in ventilation parameters. Okay, so you saw this graph before. You've got a viral response phase. It looks like right now that the peak viral shedding takes place about seven hours before symptoms start. Uh, this is an upper airway, nasopharyngeal shedding, high viral replication, uh, no neutralizing antibodies are taking place. Then the virus moves down deeper and deeper in the lungs. You start getting um, different antibody production that's systemic, and you also start getting IgA production. So the IgA is being secreted in the nasopharyngeal. It's probably IgA that's involved with neutralizing this and decreasing viral shedding. Um, and once the virus is deeper in the lungs, it becomes much more pathogenic, but it becomes less infectious. Then you get this hyperinflammation phase and a hypercoagulable phase, and you develop an ARDS-like picture. You get a systemic inflammatory response, shock, cardiac failure. A lot of the cardiac toxicity is probably due to this hypercoagulable state also. The super high C-reactive protein, high LDH, high IL-6, super high D-dimer, ferritins can be in the two to 3,000. You get a troponin leak, then a, um, a pro-BNP elevation that takes place. So really what we're gonna need to do is get our medications developed and treat people super early. It's gonna be hard to treat them before they're symptomatic, um, but if somebody's got exposure, uh, high-risk exposure, prophylactic therapy uh, medications uh, may be uh, used at that time. But at this time, there's no evidence that hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine abrogates uh, people in a risk uh, environment. So you've got asymptomatic, you've got this high infectivity, you get an initial uh, viral replication phase, you get a hyperimmune response, and then you've got uh, a cyclical response in patients. And remember, people um, have been documented quote unquote, that people are getting reinfected or they get a relapse of this. The problem with those statements are is that we're measuring virus in uh, nasopharyngeal swabs, nasal swabs, oral swabs. Um, and also there's evidence that uh, of RNA in stools, but PCR is picking up RNA fragments. That doesn't mean when you measure RNA and you have a positive PCR, that, that person is specifically infectious. So we need to improve our PCR testing so where we can say whether we're getting fragments or we're getting full length virus. Uh, but uh, clearly these asymptomatic individuals can transmit virus and uh, hyper uh, risk early in the course of the symptomatic disease. So we got a lot of goals to try to treat these individuals and get to a result where we abrogate this uh, disease. I'm gonna go back to remdesivir now. This is the uh, article that was in New England Journal of Medicine about two weeks ago. This is basically talking about patients moving from invasive to non-invasive oxygenation. So let's just take a look at the left column. Baseline oxygen support, you had 34 patients, you either were intubated or on ECMO. And as you move those patients through the clinical trials, nine moved to non-invasive, 24% moved to room air, sorry, three moved to non-invasive, uh, eight moved to room air, eight were discharged. You had a 57% improvement. At the time that this was published, when people had invasive either ECMO or were intubated, the mortality rate, it's not just getting them extubated, I'm talking about mortality rate was ranging between 50 and 80%. You can also see patients that were moving from non-invasive, low flow oxygen and room air uh, moving those to being discharged from the hospital, high number. So this, this paper really helped give us a lot of information. What I expected to see from the NIH trial that was um, data that was released today. 
I do want to also step back and remember a week ago, WHO leaked something on their website about a clinical trial with remdesivir that quote unquote failed. That was a news leak about the China trial, which was underpowered and the trial was stopped due to poor enrollment. So they only met a quarter of their enrollment target um, in that Chinese trial. So we just have to discount that trial completely. So we have a compassionate use program, open label that was present. Um, it's now been moved to what's called an early access program. If you patients are not candidates for clinical trials, so there's actually broad based availability. What I do know is a general statement that Gilead about eight weeks ago and moving even probably to 10 weeks ago, moved like an aircraft carrier, if I can use a metaphor, to use moving their entire organization to focus on remdesivir development and production. So there's a huge amount of remdesivir that's now sitting and packaged and being uh, moved through clinical trials so patients can get access to this earlier and earlier. So we're really seeing uh, some uh, really substantial changes taking place in terms of drug development. This is a list of all the different clinical trials that are ongoing. You can take a look at this later. There's a short slide deck and a longer slide deck that will be ava available to everybody. Uh, but because we had limited time, I wasn't going to go through this in, in great detail. Another thing that was a hot topic was using steroids, especially in these patients who are developing pulmonary insufficiency and an ARDS-like syndrome. The data right now says with steroids, we have increased mortality. So steroids have to be used in very, very selective patients under very selective uh, controlled environments in the hospital, in the ICU setting. Steroids are in general not a good idea and not recommended. IDSA has come out with a series of recommendations. So you can, you can look at these later, uh, recommendation one through eight. But basically they're talking about using all of these medications in controlled settings or Things like lopinavir, ritonavir, uh, don't use them unless it's in a clinical trial, uh, and they're suggesting against the use of steroids. So they're making some pretty strong statements here unless the patient has ARDS. Um, Teclizumab, also suggestion that it's working, but again, uh, using it in the context of clinical trials. Uh, we should not be seeing news releases about these different medications and people going out and buying them, and hoarding them, and storing them at home, and taking them prophylactically. That was really a severe overreaction that took place. Uh, let's see, I think we've covered everything on this slide. There's another medication called Favipiravir. Uh, this is being developed by Fujifilm, um, a Japanese pharmaceutical company and that's going into clinical trials. There's in vitro data that that has an anti-coronavirus uh, effect also. Uh, there's other IL-6 inhibitors, there's other cytokine release medications that are being developed as well. The name of those are, um, and a lot of detail are on there in the longer slide deck that will be uh, released to this group. Uh, one, um, back to the vaccine story, one vaccinologist said it may require multiple vaccines to stop this pandemic from taking place. I want to remind you that uh, we have an influenza syndrome, uh, H1N1, that started in 1918. Uh, a lot of uh, history about where that virus started, but it was probably started in western Kansas, moved to Fort Riley, um, went into um, the soldiers that were uh, being moved to World War I across the ocean. It spread uh, throughout the um, British, American, French, and German troops. This appeared uh, during the summertime, but then reappeared in the fall. There was a huge relapse that took place. And of course, vaccine development for this didn't take place really at a good level until the 1970s. The H1N1 flu uh, disappeared in 1957 and then reappeared in 1977, 20 years later. And now it recycles in different forms, uh, different mutations, and we have to come out with a vaccine. So. Uh, this um, COVID-19 or um, coronaviruses have just basically mutated, become more pathogenic, and may become a part of our seasonal flus that we uh, see during the rest of our, our lifetime. So you're going to hear a little bit more about antibodies. We talked about direct antivirals. We talked about vaccines. Uh, people have thought about stem cell therapies. There's some clinical trials that are ongoing there. 
Um, there may be other protease inhibitors that may help. There may be entry inhibitors that can block the uh, binding to the ACE2 receptor. And then some other repurposed drugs, such as nitosoxanide, that are in clinical trials that have a good safety margin that may be able to be used more uh, broad base. So I want to thank you uh, for having me here for this uh, presentation. I, I cut short my very, very long talk, but uh, a lot more data is available through a larger slide deck through your organization. And do we have time uh, for a uh, question, James? And, uh, uh, yes, uh, I have a question for both uh, Dr. Yish and Dr. Tha. Um, so uh, at this point, um, where or when would you recommend uh, remdesivir uh, be started on the patient um, who checks into the hospital, for example? Well, it's only gonna be available through these early access or through clinical trials. But I think the earlier, the better. So if someone comes in PCR positive and they deserve hospital admission, in my ideal world, they would be on remdesivir as they move from the ED up to their room in the hospital. Right, so that's, that's, that's what I'm seeing too, is that you know, I'm, I'm uh, seeing some of these patients at Hogue and you know, there's only, Dr. Gish is right, there's, it's only available through um, early access or the clinical trials. And in Orange County, the only the only places that are involved in the clinical trial are both Newport, Hope Irvine, um, I think some of the Providence hospitals, I think St. Jude's, um, I'm not sure if St. Joseph's, I know all the Kaiser hospitals have remdesivir trials. So it is, you know, that's where we're using it is you have to have a positive result. Um, you have a positive PCR test uh, documented and then basically you enroll into the trial. So that, that brings to you know, the importance of rapid testing. You can't sit there and wait for like five days, you know, waiting for a test, and, you know, you can't enroll. So those places that don't have rapid testing in-house, um, you know, they're basically not involved in the trial. So Kaiser has rapid testing. Everyone that gets admitted to the hospital, into the ER, everyone has a rapid diagnostic test. So you don't have any PUIs on the floor anymore in any of the Kaiser hospitals. And at home, they basically have rapid testing as well, so you know, you know if they're, they're positive or not. And then if it's positive, then the principal investigators basically go and interview them and get consent, and they get started. Um, well, the, this is coming back to what the, Dr. Gish mentioned in terms of RNA fragments. I want to go over that in a little bit more detail. When you uh, pick up RNA fragments, that means that there's an overflow of RNA materials being used by a cell the eukaryotic cell to build some of its building blocks to function for cellular function. So what Dr. Gish was mentioning is that in addition to picking up the actual RNA fragment within the nucleotidal capsid of the virus, these PCR tests are also picking up the building blocks or RNA fragments that the cells require to use for the cellular function. So in that sense then, Dr. Gish and Dr. Da, how effective or how specific is it to rely on a PCR test in order to institute remdesivir? Well, that, the PCR test that you see, if it shows positive, it's going to be either a whole, whole viral length or it's going to be a fragment of that coronavirus. It's not going to pick up RNA, a messenger RNA um, from other cell functions. So um, pro the problem is we have lots of endonucleases that are constantly breaking down DNA sequences, RNA sequences. Um, if a patient's asymptomatic and they're 10 to 20 days out from their clinical syndrome and they're PCR positive, but their normal oxygen, chest x-ray is clear, normal temperature, normal D-dimer, normal SED rate, that's a false positive in the sense of not indicating an active viral infection. That's my opinion. Right, and then, you know, the inclusion criteria for the, for at least for the Gilead trials at Hogue, they, you know, they include um, temperature as one parameter as well as chest x-ray findings. They're, they're fairly loose in terms of the inclusion, you know, with, with just something on the chest x-ray, but, you know, you have to have something in order to enroll in including the positive tests. So I, I see a comment here from uh, Dr. Dukwing uh, mentioning uh, UCI uh, having a stage three remdesivir trial phase. Now, what is Hogue at? Is that also stage three? Or what? Yeah, I mean, Hogue is, the, Hogue is the Gilead trial. I think UCI couldn't get into the Gilead trial. They're in the NIAD trial. They're the one where they um, put 
like a placebo arm. Okay, uh, anyone else has questions for Dr. Yish and Dr. Tha? That was a fantastic uh, uh, presentation there. Um, before we move on to talk lesson plasma, if, if you have a question, you can uh, unmute and ask. Okay, um, let me just uh, scroll through here. Um, let me see. Sorry, um, are you able to see my, um, my slides? Presentation here. Uh, Dr. Long, uh, can you see the slide? Yes, I can. Okay, all right. So, next speaker we have is Dr. Uh, Tok Zhang. She's a uh, gynecologist um, in the uh, Orange County area, and uh, she will be speaking on convalescent plasma. Uh, I will move the slides along. And Dr. Tok, uh, do you want to start? I think you have to unmute. I think you have to unmute your. Um... Yes, thank you. Um, is this my my slide here? Uh, no. Uh, let me just uh, go through that. Okay. okay. There we go. Yeah. So, um, um, my one of my um, I'm not just a gynecologist. Uh, my other job is that I am a medical director of the. Uh, uh, a company that makes uh, plasma-derived medication. It's called Ripples, and we are the leading global producer of plasma-derived medications in 30 countries and 440 um, branches in the United States. And so, um, you know, I took this job because I thought it was nine to five, it would be easy. When I go home, I don't have to even worry about any of that, uh, anything. I don't have to take anything home from work. And then this happened. And so then our company uh, was tapped by the FDA and uh, to produce uh, and to uh, uh, be a part of the uh, COVID-19 solution. And one of the things that I wanted to first say is that uh, it's very difficult to follow uh, my little spiel or talk uh, after Dr. Gish's talk, which is very, which is excellent, and uh, I appreciate you doing that, Dr. Gish. And um, um, I just wanted to add on to my talk in that um, convalescent plasma has been used and studied of through the SARS-CoV-1 epidemic in 2003, and 2009, H1N1 influenza, and 2012, MERS-CoV epidemic. Um, and then for the non-coronaviruses, it's been recently um, uh, used uh, for the Ebola uh, epidemic as well. Um, currently, the FDA recommends uh, there are several pathways, three pathways available for administering or studying uh, the use of uh, COVID-19 convalescent plasma. The first one is clinical trials. You can do clinical trials uh, or you can use it for expanded access uh, indications, which is used for serious or immediate life-threatening uh, through acute care facilities like major medical centers like we had just talked about. Um, or you can use uh, single patient emergency indications uh, for the use of um, convalescent plasma for COVID-19. And so a lot of the uh, uh, use for convalescent plasma currently has been for expanded access just because it's like the last thing that we can use uh, when all else is not working because it's so expensive and so difficult to access convalescent plasma because you have to wait for patients to get it and recover. And um, so it's, it, it's, it's kind of uh, difficult as far as access is concerned. Uh, the, with convalescent plasma, um, what happens is a, a, a patient who has COVID-19, they've recovered, and what we do is we obtain the 
plasma, if the patient comes to uh, donate their plasma, they just basically sit in a chair and uh, in about 45 minutes, uh, blood is drawn from them uh, through that whole time and through several cycles, usually three to five cycles, they, their blood goes into a machine and that performs plasmapheresis. It separates their plasma from the red blood cells. And what happens is the red blood cells is returned back to the donor while they're sitting there. And the plasma is collected in a, um, a bottle. And that, then that plasma is sent to the lab. And through, so uh, the process of collecting the, um, drawing the blood, um, and then separating the blood from the plasma and the blood going back to the donor, it happens in about three to five cycles through that full time to collect enough plasma. And because the red blood cells are returned to the donor, uh, the donor can actually donate. And they can do it twice a week, just not on two consecutive days. So they can... Uh, so the, as far as donation, you can donate plasma a lot more than you can donate blood. Uh, because if you can imagine if you lose red blood cells, you get weak and you just can't, you can only donate blood every, uh, at, at the earliest is eight weeks, every eight weeks. And so plasma, um, uh, has been used in several different ways. And as far as medication is concerned, the most important aspect of of the plasma is actually um, the seven percent um, of what the plasma is made of, and so in our blood we have fifty-five uh, percent of our blood is plasma. It's made up of plasma. Forty-three percent is the, is the is the red blood cells. So with that fifty-five percent of uh, plasma. Um, 7% of that is protein. And within that protein, there's about 20% of that protein is made up of immunoglobulins. And this is where, and then the, um, the others are, are um, you know, clotting factors and those are kind of things that are uh, made to, uh, into medications as well. Um, and uh, let me see here about, 3% of the plasma is fibrinogen, and then uh, the other 20% is alpha beta globulin. Some of that is uh, for clotting black factors as well. Uh, you know, that all of that inclu includes like factor eight and all those kinds of things that's used for medications. Um, and then 60% of the plasma is albumin. But, if, but what we're looking at right now for the COVID-19 that's important is the immunoglobulins. That's that 20% of the um, 15 to 20% of the plasma. And, um, and what happens is um, we, not only can you transfuse that directly, give that to uh, a patient who is severely ill from COVID-19 currently, and that's what... Uh, when you talk about convalescent plasma currently, that's what most people are talking about. Just getting the plasma from someone who's uh, recovered, uh, and then once you've harvested that plasma, uh, you check the titer and then you give it to, uh, infuse it to the patient who is sick, severely ill of COVID-19. The problem with that, or the what makes it difficult is that the titers of the donor vary. So you can have someone who has recovered, but their titer may be low, or someone who uh, has recovered, but their titer is high. So you just don't know what you're gonna get. Uh, traditionally, what is thought of is the ones who've been severely ill and have recovered, they tend to have a higher titer than the ones who are just sick and just recovered at home. But that, you know, we don't really, we're not really sure of that. And that's one of the studies that we're doing as well. But uh, the traditional uh, uh, view of convalescent plasma right now is just directly uh, trans giving uh, plasma that's 
harvested and directly giving it to the um, uh, uh, patient who is severely ill from COVID-19. And what is uh, interesting is that there is another step forward into uh, making a, or using the convalescent plasma. Uh, and I'm gonna go over that in a little bit. But first, the indications for convalescent plasma is um, that the um, donor has to test positive at the time of illness. So they have to come with a uh, positive uh, documentation of a positive test or um, or a positive serology test for the SARS-CoV-2 antibody after recovery. If there is no prior diagnostic test that was done at the time that they are ill. And uh, so that is one indication. And the other one is that they have to have complete resolution of symptoms greater than 28 days prior to the donation. Or if they have complete resolution of symptoms um, greater of more than 14 days prior to donation and a negative result for the uh, virus with by nasal uh, pharyngeal swab or by net testing. Um, and they also have, the donor has to be between 18 and 69 years of age. Um, and so right now with convalescent uh, plasma, the, uh, you, the, if someone fits these criteria and they want to donate, they can go to either the American Red Cross or some of the plasma centers. Uh, there are plenty of plasma centers around the country that are participating uh, in the collection of, uh, of this as well as not just the Griffles company. Um, and I wrote, I have this phone number, the National Call Center, they can call at, at uh, Anytime, anywhere around the country, they can call and they can find out if they're indicated for uh, to be able to be a donor for the uh, convalescent plasma program and um, and where they would like to go to get that done. So they they just have to call this number one eight six six E N D C O nineteen and they can be routed for uh, to be as a donor for a convalescent plasma program. Uh, so what our company not only just does this convalescent plasma, uh, the direct transfusion, but we also were tapped by the FDA as well to do uh, get IVIG uh, for SARS-CoV-2. And what that means is we use, we collect the plasma, uh, convalescent plasma, and what we do is we isolate uh, the immunoglobulin section of the plasma. So through very uh, multiple uh, steps, you can isolate out the gamma globulin, the immunoglobulin, uh, through chromatography, and you concentrate it down to uh, a, 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 a vial. Uh, so you pull, you get convalescent plasma, pull them together, uh, and run through several different steps. You isolate the um, immunoglobulin and concentrate it into a vial. And what that, how that is important is that it provides consistent uh, and reproducible dosages. So then what the, what the FDA is asking us to do is because we're the only company that is able to do that is to concentrate it down. Uh, it's called microfractionation. And so when we are able to produce these quote unquote medications into the vial, you don't have to worry about whether uh, this person's uh, plasma is titers enough to be able to be used to this patient, or does the blood type match? Because all that is erased, all those variables are erased. If we can produce this in the vial, and then you can, uh, pharmacies, doctors, can um, be able to dose it. And 
So what you can use it for is for clinical trials. It will speed up with all the answers as needed because now you have uh, immunoglobulins that you can titrate and you can uh, identify what dosages and how long you can, uh, what therapies are uh, are appropriate and which one has you know less side effects and all those things. So all these things you can standardize um, by creating this IVIG that's specific to SARS-CoV-2. And so we just started doing that two weeks ago. And so the process is going to be ongoing. We don't know how long it'll take us to do this, but it's a very exciting field. And, um, and I think from past experiences with other viruses, not just Corona, but Ebola, just in, just in recent history, uh, it's made such headway as far as convalescent plasma, uh, but it is expensive. And so, uh, so this is a, a very exciting aspect of convalescent plasma that I wanted to share with all of you. And so uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. So, Dr. Tatra, thank you for that presentation. I have several questions here from attendees, if the um, uh, panelists are willing and stay on the line um, for a few more minutes, um, uh, please do. And if you're just exhausted from answering questions, uh, <laughs> you can sign <laughs> off. Um, but uh, Dr. Tartran, I have a question for you in regards to your program versus the Orange uh, County, um, I mean, Orange Coast Memorial Medical Center. I just received news this morning that if we wanted to refer patients for, to, uh, for plasma exchanges, uh, then contact uh, the um, home attendants at Orange Coast Memorial Medical Center. So yeah. how's that different? Well, the, when, when you donate plasma there, it, it is no different. People have a choice, but uh, uh, if you donate there, what happens is those kinds of plasma centers, people can come and donate once and then they can go wherever and that plasma is used. Uh, but uh, since uh, the, when you're dealing with a plasma center is what we do all day, every day, and, and this company is the founder of this company is the, is the man, his name is Griffles. And he is the one who actually um, discovered uh, plasmapheresis in the sense that where you collect plasma and you return the red blood cells to the donor. So it allows for much more massive amounts of donations. Okay, so, so physicians. Plasma. And so the, this is really important. In the plasma industry, when you have a donor who comes in consistently, the risk that is in their plasma, like risk of uh, 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 other infections, uh, things that would uh, preclude them from being a donor, preclude someone from being a donor, or defer someone from being a donor, uh, is much less when they come consistently. That's the history of plasma is like that. So okay. people who come for uh, for our for our company, people who don't come regularly, we toss their, we don't use their plasma even in emergency like this. So like a Red American Red Cross, when they donate plasma for whatever reason that's used for, they can only they can come once and and it will be used. But when you get plasma from uh, from then, it's just, you just kind of, you you get the, you can acquire those risks that we talk about when we counsel patients on blood transfusions and blood product transfusions, right? Uh, we all know that. Uh, but when you get your plasma from a company uh, like, uh, that's been in the industry for so long and, and, and from a private company like this, the screening process is so strong that the risk of catching anything is so much less. So okay. that's a difference. And the other difference is that uh, when we, when they, people donate plasma for COVID-19, for convalescent plasma program, we use it for the, also for the IVIG as well. So we are, we have a two phases of this fight in the COVID-19 uh, convalescent plasma program. 
So we not only do the direct transfusion, but we also are making the IVIG as well. Okay. Uh, so I have a question here for either Dr. Gish or Dr. Tha, uh, in regards to the hydro, uh, hydro uh, chloroquine. Um, what can we do um, to uh, prevent patients from uh, crashing uh, in, in the emergency room with cardiomyopathy after hydroxy, after taking HCQ hydroxychloroquine? Uh, Dr. They, Dr. Gish, you may have so to... So after they've taken it already and they have like a cardiomyopathy? Yes, correct. Yeah. I don't know how you would prevent anything. I don't know what you would do after that. I mean, it's more, it's now, that's now more an issue of like their cardiomyopathy and, you know, their QT issues then rather than anything else. Which are less okay. I suppose that the, 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 the person who posed the question was concerned about the, the public um, taking on this hydro, hydroxychloroquine as something as a, uh, as a uh, way to treat uh, the condition, so they just take them haphazardly and so right. on. I mean, that's even more a reason not to just, you know, haphazardly take things like that, because people can have just this, you know, QT prolongation syndrome and you don't know about it. And I have a comment here from another listener saying, uh, combination treatment uh, is unknown. Uh, we should remember that a, a treatment for HIV, hepatitis B, and C took years, and there's no magic bullet. Uh, do you agree with that? Uh, is, that is that something that, uh, uh, that we should look at? Uh, not just uh, and remdesivir is really not a magic bullet, but you know, it takes time. I'm going to be an optimist here because hepatitis C, we do have a magic bullet. We've got a 98% cure rate with um, less than 12 weeks of treatment. Um, HIV is a retrovirus. It hides in lymphocytes. Hepatitis B is a retrovirus. It hides in liver cells. So I think the coronavirus is an RNA virus. It's got no um, sanctuaries. It doesn't have a retroviral component to it. Um, and we know a huge amount about this because of SARS and MERS. So I think we'll come up with combination antiviral therapy in less than 18 months, and it will be a, probably a two medication combination that will be taken immediately at the beginning of symptoms like we do with Tamiflu. And we'll probably will take the disease down to being a one to three day illness. I mean, I take Tamiflu and I get flu-like symptoms, whatever it is, shuts off in six hours. I'm back at work later that day or the next day. And I think we'll be there with the coronavirus. Um, everybody is pouring billions of dollars of research. The best minds in the world are working on this. I think we'll have a vaccine. Um, we'll start seeing results in less than a year and we'll have combination therapy in less than a year. Another question I have here is that in your experiences uh, to, doctor, to the panelists here, um, are there any cases, data of people with COVID-19 requiring hospitalization that also have HIV as a comorbidity? Uh, there are no reports of HIV as comorbidity uh, in these cases. Any theories as to why? Why not? There, there's extensive information on HIV-infected individuals getting SARS-CoV-2. I can't quote you what all that data is, but there's some really good websites that have all that information. So in New York, which is an epicenter, uh, which also has a large, large HIV patient population, um, but the, the website that I posted in the chat is called NATAP. You can go onto that website and you'll be able to see at least 10 or 15 articles on the HIV SARS interaction, SARS-CoV-2. And uh, any uh, comments uh, from uh, the, the panelists here on the protective um, feature of BCG um, for uh, tuberculosis epidemic vaccine? Uh, the, the, the mentions of two World Health Organization clinical trials on this. I'm I mean, sure it, BCG is just a general immune stimulant, so there may be uh, a certain immunomodulatory effect but I'm living right on the border with Tijuana. Every hospital in Tijuana is completely saturated with um, SARS-CoV-2 infections, COVID-19. They, most of the Mexicans have had BCG. I'm not, I'm not seeing any abrogation of disease severity, even in spite of the Obrador making statements about how strong the Mexicans are a month ago. Um, this is a disaster in Mexico, and they've had extensive BCG exposures. I think it's going to be a very modest effect. It's probably going to be more of an epidemiologic phenomenon. 
Okay, and then um, another uh, question is, um, um, let's see here. Okay, you mentioned go to NAPAP website. That's excellent, thank you. Um, it's another comment here. I haven't seen anybody infected with COVID who had HIV. Um, my HIV patients are extraordinarily compliant and stay at home. Um, not sure whether the medications they're taking uh, have any role of prophylaxis. Uh, I think that's just a comment. Uh, but most patients nowadays are not on protease inhibitors. Um, any, any comments, any thoughts on Coletra? I, pres I presume that's a protease inhibitor medication. Having some role in this treatment? Just to the panelists, anyone want to comment? I think Coletra is flopinavir and it's been, it's been shown not to work. So I'm gonna say that's off the table. No one's recommending that use at this time. Um, can, can um, I'm sorry, can someone um, comment about the role of nicotine? Because I had read recently that uh, the, there was surprisingly low amount of patients, COVID patients who are smokers. So there is some talk that it could be that there, I think there's a study going on as well, whether nicotine is uh, maybe protective I know nothing about that. I haven't heard anything about that. I know that uh, the, the studies in China were that men and men who are smokers had the highest mortality. We're in the highest mortality group. So I, oops, I'm shocked. But they're also looking at H2 blockers. So I think people are pulling at straws out of the air, looking at anything they can if they don't have anything. All this is going to go away when we get, um, you know, I think real science on the front. Yeah. Um, Okay, this uh, working hypothesis is potentially protective effects from ARVs uh, or even using HIV PrEP, P-R-E-P, as potential chain terminator in the SARS-CoV-2 cycle. Um, I, I don't know, any comments on that? Um, reduce, there's a, maybe some reduction in length of stay in the hospital if you started it within 10 days of symptoms. Um, I think this, uh, this question is referring to Kalitra again. Sorry, that was my question. <laughs> um, and that was just a feedback for the previous discussion of HIV and Can you speak up a little bit? I think you're phasing out. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, sorry, that was my uh, feedback for the previous question that I've asked that, you know, uh, currently, there has not been any cases from the cohorts that I'm speaking with in terms of uh, having HIV as a comorbidity and requiring uh, hospitalization. Um, but, you know, now we're kind of focusing on remdesivir as a kind of the main antiviral for this, given that Dr. Fauci just responds with his package today saying it does reduce length of stay, um, you know, from 11, I think from 15 to 11 days or so. But um, there's just some discussion in the HIV community to using ARVs or even uh, NRTIs like Truvada or um, the SCOBY as a potential prophylaxis for COVID-19. I'm gonna say that there is in vitro data that tenofovir and cefosfavir, tenofovir, TDF or TAF, um, cefosfavir of course is part of hepatitis C treatment have an effect, um, uh, an antiviral effect on coronaviruses. So in vitro, both of these drugs have an antiviral effect, uh, but there's no data in humans to support that yet. Okay, the next question is, can HIV screen test be falsely reactive in COVID patients? About two months ago, I had a young college student screening HIV with positive, but further Western blot was negative for all those specific HIV proteins. Um, I need no to question. Great um, question. I think it wouldn't hurt to retest though, because I mean, in terms of HIV testing and you're testing it for like the GP120 protein, um, I'm not sure, I'm not aware that, you know, SARS-CoV-2 has that expression. And yes, and in terms of prevention, uh, the question of uh, regard, uh, regarding infection control in outpatient surgery center for the panel, um, can I have a, a comment about? Yes, Dr. Duke. Hi, this you? is uh, Duke. Good, yeah. Duke and GI. Uh, it's good to hear Bob. To next. K. 
KOL meeting of listening to your phone from them. Uh, it's probably not uh, years of, of you were doing endoscopy. I probably know who you had. Uh, Dr. Duke, you, you may want to uh, uh, speak a little bit more closely to your microphone. Somehow you're phasing in and out. Okay. Is this better? Yes. My question uh, is regarding the patient uh, and you uh, and Kirby and what? I think you're phasing in and out again. I think there's something that's wrong with your connection. You, you may want to type that question then. Because okay. Uh, or you want to try again and just speak a bit more slowly? Okay. Can well, you while we're waiting for Dr. Duke to um, um, come back on the line with his question, uh, I, we, we were uh, meant to talk about uh, reopening of the uh, of medical offices. It would probably be better for you to uh, log in to the CMA uh, website and listen to the talk tomorrow. I think it will be... Uh, 30, uh, but essentially, um, it just uh, you know, the, the CMA protocol you probably received by email uh, for reopening of your medical offices include physical distancing, uh, universal masking, continue to use telehealth. Um, you can uh, reuse protective equipment, but you have to pay attention to the CDC guidelines. You don't want to um, continue using it uh, while we're seeing uh, uh, going from patient to patient. Um, and, uh, but I think that it will probably, uh, we'll probably have more time uh, at a later date, or maybe that you can log into the webinar tomorrow by the CMA. Um, any other comments? Um, uh, that is Dr. Duke, are you on the line or? Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Okay, great. Uh, quick question, uh, uh, the could be, uh, there is a center that requested me to sit with the patient 30 minutes after the procedure or getting out of the room. Uh, has there been any evidence that this actually is for the patients? So I suppose the question is, so, uh, did you, the, the physician who does procedures have to observe the patients for 30 minutes after the procedure? Um, you have to be at the bedside, I think. Um, Dr. Gish, Dr. Tha, is there any comment on uh, post-procedural post monitoring of these patients um, and, so, and so on in regards to the COVID-19 uh, infection. Is that right, Dr. Duke? Yeah. I'm not aware. Yeah, I don't know of anything about that. I don't know why it would make a difference. Okay. Uh, I, I try to uh, educate. Uh, I don't I'm missing any data that came out just this done because I, I see no uh, benefits of sitting with a patient for half an hour after the procedure ended. Um, any any comments on the, um, the the treatment protocol from the um, East Virginia uh, Medical School um, ICU group, uh, Dr. Gish and Dr. Da, in regards to their, their views on ventilation, proning, and also um, their views on um, uh, just supportive treatment with um, uh, not treating patients like a ARDS. Well, I think number one is they learned that in intubating later is better than intubating early because the me mechanical ventilation has its own injury cycle on the lung. Uh, you were very clear in your presentation how this is a, a posterior um, lower lung infiltrated process and having a patient prone improves oxygenation. That's something that was done back in the 1950s. I remember when I was growing up, my father was involved with you know, doing this with the patients. And I said, oh my gosh, this is a 60, 70 years later, they're doing the same thing. But if it works, it works. Um, and I, I think they've learned a lot about managing these patients, you know, keeping them reasonably hydrated, uh, you know, avoiding antibiotics unless there's a clear indication for antibiotics or other antivirals. Uh, I, I think the, the, the ICU care has been well refined. That's why our, our ICU mortality rate, which remember was originally in China, was 50 to 80% once you're intubated. We have mortality rates that are you know almost 10% of that in a lot of the hospital settings now. So we've got much better care. 
I mean, how realistic is it for uh, physicians at Orange Coast Memorial or Palm Valley to do proning? I mean, I, I remember working in the ICU, um, having to use a certain kinds of devices and meds in order to prone the patient while intubated. You're, you're beyond my skill set with that question. Uh, I just, um, I, I'm just wondering if anyone can share with me uh, their views on proning. Uh, have you seen that done at, in our county, in Orange County? Yeah, it can be done. I mean, it's ideally it's done before they're intubated. I'm sorry, you're um, speaking? No. That's me. I'm sorry. It's torn. Hello? Hi. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. It's, I mean, it is, it is done. I mean, I have a patient at Orange County Global who was prone, trying to prevent him from getting intubated, but, um, you know, how do you do that? How, how would you do that? Do you have the patient uh, lie prone on a bed with an opening? And the... No, he turns his head to the side and basically he just lays there like that and he feels a lot better. So he enjoys doing that rather than, you know, feeling short of breath, uh, supine. Okay. Okay. I think we probably have exhausted all of our um, um, uh, questions here. Uh, if there's any other comment, please share. Otherwise, um, you can share online or by email. Uh, with the uh, with uh, Dr. Long Wing. Dr. Long Wing, do you have any comments? Uh, if you need, if anyone who attends needs a um, a copies of the slide decks um, that we presented this evening, um, please uh, request it from uh, uh, Dr. Long Wing or Dr. Gina Tran Tran. Uh, thank you, everyone, for sharing your experience. Uh, I have a question. I think there's a person who asked. Uh, you missed the beginning of the presentation. Is there a recording of this? Uh, that you can uh, ah, think to? I am sure somebody uh, recorded the entire uh, me meeting. Uh, has, did anyone record? I haven't recorded anything. Usually I would get permission from the presenters before I record, but I didn't this time. But no, I did not. I did, did anyone record without us knowing? <laughs> not that I, we can. Uh, by the way, in the state of California, you need two parties to consent to the recording before you can record. But, no. It doesn't seem like there's an affirmative answer to that after long, so I don't think anybody um, um, recorded. But we're, I'll be we'll be happy to forward the slide deck to them. Okay, we'll do that. Eh? All right, Dr. Gish, uh, it's, it's a pleasure meeting you, Dr. Ta. Thank you very much for joining, and I appreciate your, your time, the opportunity, uh, and your time, Dr. Tuck Tran, uh, uh, and uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.